So the question of whether our universe had a beginning or how it began is surely one of the perennial questions that humanity has asked from time immemorial. And today we have a remarkable set of answers that have come out. I, I come to you because of your work as an observational cosmologist, looking back in time very substantially, looking at supernova, to ask you, when you look at the data going, going back, how does that reflect on the beginning of the universe? There, I think there are a few ways in which this kind of you know, observational measurement study can tell you about the beginning of the universe. And maybe the first way uh, to mention is just that we're making progress in this funny reverse chronolo chronological approach where you understand a little bit further back and a little bit further back and a little bit further back. And so, you know, we've gotten to the point that we can explain a lot of what we see around us now and, and then you work your way back a billion years and you explain, well, okay, what the predecessors of that you know, period were and then another billion years. And then eventually we get back to this time that we uh, see with the cosmic microwave background, uh, you know, an image of the hot and cold spots in the uh, very, very early universe just as light became free from this, this soup, uh, this very dense soup that was, you know, we think was one of the very early stages of the universe. And then we're now trying to develop new techniques. I mean, I'm saying we in the sense of cosmology, um, trying to develop techniques of looking at what was going on just before that, that wall. Uh, can we see perhaps uh, the effects of you know, gravity, gravitational waves mm. coming out from just before that, that wall? And every time you do this, you push our, you know, our ignorance back a little bit further in time. And you hope that that will give you clues as to what went on just before and just before to the point that maybe you can dissolve the mystery. You know, maybe you can actually get to the point that you understand how did our universe start. It's a tough route to go, of course, right? because in some sense, you, you may always find yourself pushing against a philosophical question, which is, OK, suppose we explain the whole thing um, at the very end by saying, oh, all we need to do is to write down this one physics equation that explains how physics works, and then suddenly everything else happens. Mm -hmm. Still, you're in, in this business of, of saying, all right, but then the beginning is the physics equation. And, uh, and how satisfying that feels to you is just that probably personal taste. Um, I, actually, I don't mind it that much, but it's, but it, but it is, uh, you know, it's that sort of direction that you're, that you're trying to go. Yeah. Now, now, I should say that there is another um, angle that you're, that you're trying to take, which is that you know, people are trying to be creative and trying to invent stories to tell about what the very early universe was like. And so sometimes that story involves an element in it which um, looks a little bit surprising, and you'd like to see it in action, but you can't see it back then. It's too far back in time. But instead, oh. you might be able to see an analog to it today. Ah. And so, for example, uh, you know, Alan Guth uh, you know, it talks about the, the inflationary period in the universe and has to posit that there's some way in which the universe can be uh, forced to accelerate in its expansion faster and faster. Exponentially. Precisely. And perhaps with some you know, fundamental uh, you know, energy you know, that, that's there that, that's causing this to, to occur. Um, we don't have any way right now of observing that in action, but we just happen to have discovered that in the, you know, just the past few years, we discovered that our current universe seems to be accelerating and probably um, with some energy spread throughout space that's causing that acceleration. And we don't know if it's the same thing as what was causing that early inflation, but at least it's an analogy and at least it gives us an example of an existence proof that such things can happen. Well, that's fascinating because it certainly seems extraordinarily difficult to observe the early inflation in its, in its true form. Maybe some hints of it in the cosmic mac microwave background, but going back to that time. But if now you have an analog, which you and your team and, and, and your other, other teams have dis discovered, uh, that possibly could, even though it has different characteristics, it's maybe linear as opposed to exponential, but but still, it, it's doing a surprising thing. You, you, from nothing, you're creating a repulsive force. Right, that you, that you're seeing a, a universe that can you know, reproduce faster and faster. Empty space gets, you know, there's more and more of it. Right. And so just having that as an example makes it more likely that you can, uh, you can take, uh, you, you can carry it to what you could learn about this, might tell you something about that. Might tell you something about that. And as good. you get more data and become more precise in your analysis and, and then hopefully being able to 
discern between different fundamental theories based upon uh, uh, subtle differences. Yes. Uh, that, uh, in fact, that uh, uh, teles uh, new telescope that you're conceptualizing behind me may help do. If you can do that, those kinds of theories that may be derived from that could be the ones that could help us understand the initial early inflation when we'd have no other observation. Exactly. And in fact, you know, the way when science works best, you know, when you, when you feel like you're really onto something is when there's something from this domain over here that you um, now start getting good data on. And suddenly by explaining this, you've now been able to explain that. Um, that's what makes you feel like you're onto something. And in this case, it may be that by our, and we're hoping that by understanding what's going on in this particular domain, what's going on in the history of the first, the slowing of the expansion, and then the accelerating the expansion, that that will tell us uh, some key knowledge that we can then use to explain the very early universe. And in, you, in the data that you get, I mean, you are absolutely sure that, that you are able to look back in time and, and see the development of the universe so that within the period of time that, that, that you look at, maybe from several hundred million uh, years ago to, to, what, four or five billion years ago in, in this, that, that you see a clear universal history that is completely consistent with, with uh, the, um, uh, the theoretical models of the Big Bang and everything having this beginning. Yes. Now, I should say that the, um, I mean, in some sense, I, I'd like to step back and say that, you know, what, what we found uh, in, in, our trying to under, in our attempts to understand cosmology has been that an amazingly simple set of principles, uh, an amazing simple story, has ended up explaining huge amounts. We've been able to predict uh, you know, all sorts of oh, ratios of, of, of elemental isotopes I and mean, all these different things that make sense um, in this very simple story. And uh, we've gotten away with putting very little in. I mean, it's actually been remarkably uh, you know, few components of the, of, the, of the explanation that you needed to explain most of what we see so far, at least at the level at which we've uh, been able to understand this. But um, there are a few moments where we've added an extra bit of information. We've added, we, there was a moment where, oh, back in the you know, 70s, we realized that you actually have to have more matter in the universe, more mass, than glows in the dark. Um, so there has to be stuff that we call dark matter. Um, and so uh, that had to be thrown into the story, um, we believe. And then in the recent work that, uh, that you know, our team and, and, our, and, the, uh, and, and another team have been working on um, implies that there is actually a lot of what we call dark energy in the universe. And so that has to be added to the story. So it's, it, the story is it's still pretty simple, but it has a couple extra components to it. Um, and we're trying to understand now how these things interrelate. All of which are consistent with the universe having a beginning. Exactly. And, but, but begin to enrich the understanding of what that beginning is. That's right. These are all, these are all um, just little additions to the story that actually includes the Big Bang um, you know, as its, as its um, you know, starting point. Um, of course, there are different ways of interpreting the Big Bang. Uh, you'll, you know, there are some versions of it where, you know, calling it a, you know, a point is a bad is a bad term, <laughs> a bad way to describe it. And I think there's also a tendency for us to hear the word Big Bang and think it means an explosion. <laughs> um, and, and that's also, I think, a, a, a sort of misunderstanding of what of what the theory is supposed to mean. But nonetheless, the basic idea that we came uh, that the universe we see around us apparently began in a much hotter, denser state. And then all distances between, you know, all points became, you know, much larger, does seem to be consistent with everything we see around us. What's the region that you work in, in terms of the time frames of, of the universe? Uh, what, what's the, the, the latest to the early, what, what's that middle range that you work yeah, in? Yeah, I mean, the, the particular work that we've been doing, you know, can range from a few, you know, a few millions of years back in time to 10 billion years back at the time, so two thirds of the, of the time back to the, what we think is the beginning of the universe. Uh, is, you know, are things that we can actually measure with these particular techniques we use. So you have a pretty big empire there. It's about uh, you know, two-thirds of the entire history of the universe. That's, right. uh, and that's that, your territory. No, exactly. And our colleagues you know, can extend this even further back. You know, right, of course. right, 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 right. But when they do that, they're focusing on that area. Exactly. The kinds of research that you do to determine the expansion of the universe, the nature of it, you, 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 you're not just looking at one point. You need a, you need right. a we're sequence watching the whole, of points. You we're watching the whole that. evolution. Um, over that 10 billion a year right. uh, horizon. Um, and then you can go jump ahead and see that last little bit um, is available from a different technique. Yeah, but you must see the sequence because that exactly. gives you the, the universal history. It's also, we think, the, uh, the, the time in which the universe became 
um, dilute enough that dark that the, that the matter that the uh, gravity of the matter uh, attracting isn't the only story, and that allowed us to see what we think is this acceleration, uh, because it, it was a period in which the mass was not the dominant stuff. Perhaps this dark energy was accelerating. And it's really remarkable, as you've said, that uh, we can now possibly use this uh, to, to reflect on what the, the initial dramatic exponential uh, uh, acceleration, the inflation at the very beginning, uh, might have been like. That's right. We have no other way right now to get you know, just beyond the, last, uh, the, the earliest time that we could see um, to, to try to understand really what was happening when Alan Guth and others postulate that there was this sudden expansion, uh, this accelerating expansion of the universe in the very, very earliest fraction of a second. And now we actually are seeing an acceleration today. And so it allows us to at least look at what kinds of physics can lead to an acceleration. And then you could ask questions like, well, when we end up with a theory to explain that, maybe we can then apply it to that very first fraction of a second, and it'll be, it, it might have some relevance. This is very significant. So, so describe to me the, the similarities and then also the differences between the, uh, the dark energy that's, that seems to be powering the accelerating expansion today versus that, the kind of energy that would be necessary for the initial inflation uh, ex exponential in, in the very early universe. Now, some of the similarity comes about just because we were, you know, physicists were using the same you know, bits of theory to try them out. So it's not surprising that they look similar. They both would have a you know, energy that's really spread through all of the vacuum. All of empty space has this energy associated with it back then and now. And that energy um, can make the universe expand faster. And of course, the more uh, space you have, the more of that energy you have, because it's, it, it goes with the extra space. So there's, a, there's this feeling of um, you know, the ultimate free lunch, I think Alan Guth has described it as. Uh, and so both, in both situations, you're usually using that same picture um, to, to describe things. Um, they have some differences in that you know, one of them has to turn off, because uh, you know, we know that the that the, or we believe that the very earliest picture had a very quick um, you know, exponential. Well, the exponential is a, seems to me a huge difference. Well, that's true. Because it, it accelerates, and, and that, that, that creates the, 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 a total different universal structure. But we don't so even the know difference between exponential and linear and sounds yeah. very simple, but it looks it's an enormous difference. That's true. On the other hand, if you look at the very earliest stages of an exponential, um, it could look like what we see now. Uh, you know, we don't know if it's going to turn if, if what we live in right now could turn exponential. Oh. Um, you know, if you uh, if you if you went for billions of years, you know, into the future as well. Um, it's just that obviously it didn't happen in a fraction of a second, or we. Well, I was going to say we'd know about it. We wouldn't know about it. We wouldn't be here. <laughs> right. uh, but that, but that, so in that sense, we don't know whether that's a fundamental difference between the two epochs. Um, it could be. And, and, that, and it's one of the things that you know, one would hope that these theories will give us a sense for. So one, one of the things we want to do is to develop uh, theoretical models for this dark energy that's in the current situation yeah. of, of for empty space and then see if it can fit in some form of the... That, that for right. earliest period for which it's still a bit of a cartoon model for what would cause the um, inflationary period. And you think that the more precise measurements that you will be making in the future uh, can help distinguish between different theoretical models? Is that, is that That's possible? the concept, right? Because if you look at the range, the wide range of theoretical models, they're, uh, there's some that are very difficult to distinguish, but there, but there are a, a wide variety where a, um, if you were able to see the very subtle differences between how the universe went from deceleration to acceleration, um, and you know, watch that slight difference of growth spurts. Um, that can tell you, those are the hallmarks of the difference between different possible theories. And that uh, model of, uh, of, of a new uh, telescope uh, specifically designed for cosmological exploration. Exactly. So we've proposed, uh, now it's been oh, you know, five, ten years, um, uh, that we've been working on an idea for a space telescope that would be dedicated to this kind of measurement. Now, of course, it does lots of other science while it's up there, but right. it's really designed around this particular question. And, uh, and it turns out that you actually can do a much better uh, measurement if you design your, your whole instrument around that, that, that measurement. Well, in terms of humanity's understanding of our place in the universe, what the universe is all about, I, I can't think of a more important question. It feels like that to us. <laughs>